My coworker Sadie is here. She's going to be um, looking at the chat to see if people have questions. Um, if you need to interrupt because you didn't understand something that I said during the presentation, um, you can do that, uh, no problem. But if you have general questions or just want to share memories, we will have time for a discussion at the end. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Emily Foster. I am a librarian at the Oakland History Center at the Oakland Public Library. I've been here um, just a little over a year, which has been a strange year to get started in a new job. Um, and uh, this is my actually my first presentation for the Oakland History Center, so thanks for coming. Um, and yeah, I've been doing all sorts of things here. One of my big projects has been working on the COVID-19 Community Archive, which is um, going to collect memories from people of this time and um, share them with future generations who are researching what it was like to live in Oakland and the East Bay through the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So for now, today, um, I'm gonna be talking about amusement parks of Oakland's past. So it's a little more lighthearted topic. Uh, and we're gonna be mostly focusing on Idora Park, but we're also gonna talk about things that were uh, around Oakland, not in Oakland proper. So some things in Emeryville, Alameda, San Francisco. And um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen in just a second. So let's see. And this is, so this is a picture of Idora Park. This is around 1910. Um, and so, whoops, it's automatically going. Uh, so when I was putting this presentation together, I was sort of thinking about what it is. Can everyone see my screen, by the way? Yes. Okay, okay good. Um, I was thinking about what makes an amusement park different from just a park. And I think the main thing is, uh, first of all, it's usually privately owned and operated. And secondly, um, it's a place where people have just a lot of options when they arrive. So sort of the most um, modern equivalent would be sort of like a county fair um, where you go and you can do basically anything. You can see performances, you can ride rides, you can see animals, anything you can imagine. Um, so in the early days of Oakland, people had to travel to San Francisco for this kind of experience. Um, this picture here is Woodward's Gardens, uh, which was one of the first um, amusement parks in the, in the Bay Area. This was in the Mission District of San Francisco. Uh, and it was there from 1865, which is when this picture is from, until 1891. And it was a combination of amusement park museum, art gallery, zoo, and aquarium. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and I forgot to mention, uh, all of the images in this presentation, unless otherwise noted, are things that are from the Oakland History Center's collection. So we'll have photographs, postcards, uh, ephemera, newspaper clippings, and a couple of maps too. Um, and yeah, so you can just assume these are all from the Oakland History Center, unless I tell you otherwise. Um, so Woodward's Gardens covered two city blocks. It was between Mission and Valencia and 13th and 15th. So that's where the San Francisco Armory is now on, on part of that land. Um, and we're gonna quickly move on to um, another park called Shoots on Haight Street. This opened in 1895 as well. This was named for the main attraction, which you can see in the upper left there. There's a house on stilts, kind of, um, and there are two long slides going down. Those are the chutes, and people would ride a boat down those slides into a man-made lake. So if you sort of imagine a log flume ride, but very dangerous, um, that's, that's what it was. Um, and this park moved a couple of times within San Francisco before it eventually closed in 1911. Uh, because of a fire. And then the one that's probably most familiar is the area around Ocean Beach in San Francisco that started to be developed in the 1860s when the Cliff House was built. 
So this was the first Cliff House, um, which was there 1863 to 1894. And it's burnt down and been rebuilt a lot of times, um, but this was the first one. Uh, there was a railroad, a steam railroad that went to the Cliff House. And if you've ever been to the trail at Land's End, you may have seen signage showing you where the um, railroad tracks used to be along there. Um, there was also a pavilion for concerts and dancing. And by 1884, they had a roller coaster there. Um, then um, Sutro Baths opened just north of the Cliff House in 1896. It was a huge swimming pool complex. There were seven pools, mostly salt water. Um, and they also had a museum. Uh, a lot of items from their museum came from Woodward's Gardens, which had already closed at that point. Um, this was there um, for a long time. Uh, the building was sold in 1964 and it was, the plan was to raise it for a high rise apartment building. Um, but uh, it actually burned down two years later and the plans were abandoned. So you can, if you go to Ocean Beach, you can still see the ruins of um, Sutro Baths there. And uh, we, have a, we have a question. How, do you know how they filled the pools? Uh, they filled it with water from the ocean. Um, I don't know the exact procedure, but there was a, a sort of a underground cave, I think, that water came in through. Um, and yeah, it was ocean water, but uh, much safer than swimming in the actual ocean at Ocean Beach, which is very, um, very rocky and dangerous and cold. <laughs> um, so there were other rides here too and nearby. There was a carousel, a Ferris wheel, there was a shooting gallery, a fun house and a carnival midway. Um, and this next one shows you, this is just captioned Birdman Williams at the Cliff House. Presumably this is 19th century based on their clothes. And he's got a little uh, trained bird act here. You can see the bird on the far left and it involves a gun and a lot of ladders it looks like, which seems very exciting, I guess, or, or terrible. Um, so most of the individual concessions um, in this area were combined and renamed Playland uh, at the Beach in 1926. And Playland at the Beach was there till 1972. So um, people who are watching this presentation, there's a good chance some of you probably visited there. Um, and you can even today still see some of the things that were once at Playland at the Beach if you visit San Francisco. There's the Camera Obscura right next to the Cliff House, um, the ruins of Sutro Baths, and then at, on Pier 45, there's the Musée Mécanique, which has a lot of the um, coin-operated arcade kind of uh, games and amusements. So these were exciting places for people in the East Bay to visit, but a little far away. So um, by the 1870s, we had our own parks opening up in the East Bay. So one of the first ones was this one, Badgers Park, um, which was in Clinton, now part of Oakland, uh, barely East Oakland now, but um, technically East Oakland. It's just east of Lake Merritt. So this water below Badgers Park is the Oakland Harbor and up to, going up to the left uh, on the west side is the uh, opening of Lake Merritt to estuary. So um, this map is from 1878. This is the historical atlas of Alameda County. And this park was there 1873 until around 1885. Someone has a question. I can't hear the question, sorry. Are you muted? Where is the park on the map? Okay, so if you see- um, Oh, I see Badger Park. You see it, yeah. It's sort of um, right on the waterfront there. Um, there's the dashed line, which shows the railroad, the, the middle, line there is, hopefully that is enough context. Um, so um, unfortunately I don't have any actual photos to show you of this park, but uh, some of the features were picnic grounds, a restaurant, exotic plants and animals, a uh, sailing pond, dance hall, 10 pin bowling alley, 
a baseball diamond and um, they had chariot racers with people in Roman costumes racing chariots. Um, so this park was there until the area got even more surrounded by railroad tracks than it is in this picture uh, and the land was sold for redevelopment. Um, around the same time as Badgers Park, um, Shell Mound Park opened up. This is a map from the same atlas, 1878. Oops. Um, and uh, as the name implies, it was built right on top of a sacred Ohlone shell mound. Um, on this map, you can see um, it's right there on the waterfront. There's sort of a mountainous, mountainous looking shape. That's the shell mound and shell mound park there. The willow thicket below it was also part of the park. Um, and right across the railroad tracks was the Oakland Trotting Park, which was a horse racing track, uh, later renamed the California Jockey Club. Um, and as you can see, the, um, the dashed line here is the railroad track, that's the Southern Pacific Line. And you can maybe see um, directly on the north and the south of the park, there are railroad stations. So this was really easy for people to get to. Um, and this shows you the entrance of the park. Again, there's not a ton of pictures of Shell Mound Park, which is unfortunate, but this is the entrance. Um, you can see the railroad tracks right in front. Um, and the main attractions here were dance halls, uh, there were bars and dining rooms. There was a carousel, swings, flying horses, bowling alley, and uh, the shooting range was a really uh, big deal at this park. They, they held national competitions and monthly shooting contests. Um, it was a very, very popular part of the park. Um, but it seems like the most, um, most well-known thing about Shellman Park is that it was a picnic area. So lots of lodges and clubs um, went there for picnics and banquets and meetings. Uh, this is one of the last events that I found for Shell Mound Park in the Oakland Tribune, uh, where there was a picture. Um, this is the United Negro Improvement Association, and it says they, they led a parade to Shell Mound Park, where the association recently held a picnic and outing. This is from uh, August 1924. Um, but throughout the years, it was uh, an extremely popular place to go for picnics, so any group you can imagine probably had a picnic there. Um, and most of those groups were using this um, building here. This is the dancing pavilion. Um, and Shaman Park was there, I don't know if I said this already, it was 1876 to 1924. So it had a, a good long run. Um, and this is the um, racetrack. This was uh, not technically a part of the park, but it drew a lot of traffic to the park. So um, that was was a good good thing for the park until 1911 and that's when the state made uh, horse racing illegal so when that happened uh, there was a decline in attendance at shell mound park um, and uh, in 1920 uh, prohibition went into effect which um, sort of really put a damper on shell mound park because people couldn't uh, drink at their picnics and banquets and things anymore um, and they finally closed the park in October 1924, and it was replaced with um, just industrial areas. So there was, I think, a, a pigment factory was put there. So this picture shows them um, raising the shell mound um, in 1924, but a lot of the shell mound was actually still uh, intact until the Bay Street Mall was constructed. This is um, the Bay Street Mall in Emeryville is in the same place that Shell Mound Park was. So um, uh, there's a question, yes. <laughs> when they did the excavations, did they find uh, evidence of Indian remains? They did, yes. And, and, and later when they did the further um, destruction, <laughs> shall I say, uh, when they were building Bay Street Mall, they found just a uh, an indescribable number of Indian remains. And um, it's there's still protests every year um, for they have a, a buy nothing day that the Ohlone people um, promote 
um, saying this is like a sacred burial ground, please uh, recognize that you're on sacred land here. Um, and they actually built a tiny um, memorial shell mound at Bay Street Mall, but it's, it's very easy to miss that it's there. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, there's a lot more to, to read and to say about the, the shell mounds in the Bay Area. So um, that's a topic for another presentation though. So <laughs> I'll, I'll move on somewhat quickly from that. Um, the, so after Shell Mound Park was gone, um, and even before that, people were going to Idora Park. So Idora Park opened in 1903 and closed in 1929. So um, it was right here. This is 58th Street on the north, 56 on the south, Telegraph on the east, and Shattuck on the west. So I just like that this is colorful, I guess. It doesn't, it's not a great map, but <laughs> um, then, uh, so before we start talking about Idora Park as a park, I want to show you this map. This is the Realty Syndicates, Real Estate and Electric Railways. So this map is actually one of the only things that's not from our collection. Um, this is from the California Historical Society's uh, online collection. We have a really similar one here, but I wasn't able to get a good picture of it and it has not been digitized. So I just wanna show this to show you um, how big of a reach this one company had over the East Bay or over Oakland. Um, so all the areas in red here are under their control, either land they owned or um, railroads that they were operating. So um, their Realty Syndicate is really famous for operating the key system, which um, had electric railways and streetcars all over the city. Um, but they were chiefly a real estate development group. So the reason for operating the key system and the streetcars was not like serving the public good, it was they wanted to make their real estate uh, valuable so that they could sell it. Um, so that's a spoiler for what eventually happened to Idora Park. Um, so this is um, a streetcar. On the left, you can see the entrance for Idora Park. Uh, Idora Park was built on land that was owned by the Realty Syndicate. And it was at the end of a streetcar line that was also operated by the Realty Syndicate. Um, so there's actually a name for this kind of park at the end of a streetcar line. It's called a trolley park. And um, the concept behind them was basically to uh, generate revenue for the streetcars at non-commute times. So evenings and weekends when people weren't really riding, um, they wanted something to be out there so that they could encourage people to get on the train and pay their fare and go to the park. Um, so before Idora Park, there was another park here called Ayala Park. And it was basically an undeveloped picnic ground. Um, and in 1903, a company called Ingersoll Pleasure and Amusement Park Company uh, leased this land and they opened Idora Park. Um, so this is the entrance building. Um, this is where you would pay your 10 cent entry fee or present your tickets that you'd purchased um, at one of the ticket vendors in town. Um, and when it was built, Idora Park was, was advertised as a really great way for people to save money because they wouldn't need to travel to San Francisco uh, to spend their entertainment dollars or, or nickels or whatever. Um, and reportedly it was very similar to Sh the Chutes Amusement Park in San Francisco when it first opened. So here's a couple of the tickets. Um, the admission was 10 cents. Uh, and then once you were inside, some of the, the attractions would be included in that admission fee and other things you would have to pay extra for. Um, and you can see there's a, a Wrigley Day here offering free gum and free admission. That was something that um, companies did from time to time was sponsor a day at the park where they would give people a, a free tickets for publicity. So the grounds of the park themselves were really lovely. Um, there's lots of big trees and like fountains and flowers. Um, this is a little concession stand under a willow tree. Um, 
here there's some some more trees and the caption is winter scene in Idora Park. So they're they're gloating about our lovely Oakland weather here. Um, so there's a lot of space here for those like kind of classic park functions, um, both outdoors and indoors where they hosted a lot of banquets um, and picnics, picnics and meetings just like Shell Mound Park had. Um, this one is a picture from 1907 and it's captioned ready for the merchants exchange banquet. So, um, but there was also just a, so much stuff packed into this park. Um, this map is from May 1910 and this is um, from the Tribune. They're advertising uh, Tribune Day, which was an annual free admission event sponsored by the Oakland Tribune. And I'm not gonna do a really close look at this map, um, but I'm gonna show you most of the things that are pictured on here in closer views. So um, this is um, some advertisements. These are both from the first year of the park, uh, 1903. On the left, this is the attractions they were showing for opening day. So they've got Scenic Railway, a great coal mine, uh, which I think is like a miniature version of a coal mine, I'm guessing. I didn't really see a, a real description of it, although I saw many articles saying it's very interesting. Um, laughing gallery, refreshments, gardens and lawns, high class vaudeville theater, toboggan slide, miniature railway, um, and then how to get there. And then a few months later, this other one is from July of 1903. And they've got a lot of new things already. That's why I wanted to put both of these to show you just like how often they were changing things up. Um, so they've got uh, things like new technology on display. The baby incubators were just had just been invented. Um, they've got animals, seals and sea lions, um, balloon ascensions, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, throughout the years, they also had just a, a huge number of events and um, spectacles, um, things like auto shows, pet contests. Um, there were high diving uh, exhibitions of both people and horses doing high diving. Um, and basically just anything you can imagine was there. <laughs> um, but the aeronautics was really very exciting when the, the park opened. Those, so the Wright brothers did their first flight in 1903 um, and Idora Park was hosting kind of regular um, exhibitions of different types of flying machines in the early years. So this is one of the most notable ones. This was Captain Baldwin, uh, Thomas Baldwin. He flew this um, ship, the California Arrow, as far north as 65th Street, and he circled over the park before making a landing. Uh, this was the very first successful round trip dirigible flight in the United States. Um, and he also finished the construction of this ship at Idora Park. And I'm not sure if that was something that people could come and watch him do, or if he just had a garage where he would, had rented to do that. Um, but that was probably very amazing to see. Here's another, this is um, a, a glider that was launched by a balloon uh, and successfully flown uh, by David Wilkie, uh, designed by JJ Montgomery. That was, I, I have two different dates written down for this, either 1908 or 1906, sorry about that. Um, and then there were a lot that were not as successful as well. These are some of the uh, mishaps that happened over the years. Um, so all of these headlines are from 1904 and 1905. Um, none of these people died amazingly. Um, the person in the upper right uh, where it says aeronaut has close call he fell from his balloon onto a live wire, was electrocuted, survived. <laughs> um, and another of these people, uh, they had an advertisement about a month later saying uh, they'll be sending a monkey up to do a balloon ascension. So I don't know if he was maybe still injured from his previous accident or just too scared. Um, either one makes sense. Um, but anyway, so everyone, people were still working a lot on trying to figure out new ways of flying. Um, but back on the ground, there was also a baseball diamond. It was added in 1904. Um, 
this advertise or this article was from 1906. Um, in um, after the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, the Pacific Coast League uh, relocated to Idora Park and had that as their home field. So this one is um, referring to the San Francisco seals as the refugees and the Oaks beat them in a double header, won both games. Um, and the baseball teams are- Emily, yeah. can I ask a quick, we had a quick clarifying question. What is a laughing gallery? Oh, the laughing gallery, I'm not 100% sure what the Laughing Gallery was. <laughs> um, a lot of these uh, attractions, they were advertised a lot of times and said things like, the Laughing Gallery is the best place to go for a laugh. But I, I'm not sure. Someone, someone might have a comment that can clarify. Go ahead. Um, I've, I've been to Laughing Galleries, and they have a weird uh, uh, it's like a fun gallery at Coney Island. You have uh, mirrors that are twisted so you see yourself in funny shapes. And they have air that pops up through the floor to lift your dress. And it has all kinds of it's just silly things like that. Uh -huh. So right. sort of a, a fun house, I guess. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this headline, not as fun. Um, this is after the 1906 earthquake as well. Um, the um, up to 2,500 people uh, sheltered at Adora Park for about three weeks after the earthquake. And they had food and relief supplies provided by the Realty Syndicate. Um, and apparently everyone was able to sleep indoors um, or under a roof at least because they had enough indoor space. They didn't need any tents. Um, and uh, another article called Idora um, a, a happy camp because they it was really well run and uh, apparently very few problems happened there, which is kind of amazing. Um, but this um, headline is from the San Francisco Examiner in uh, April 24th, 1906, right after the earthquake. Um, so in non-disaster times, Another thing that was pretty exciting for people in the early 20th century was getting their photo taken. So this is um, a photo concession where you would pay to get your photo taken. Uh, they printed it on a postcard and you could send it through the mail or keep it for yourself. Um, we've got a couple of these in our collection and I just wanna show all of them basically because they, I think it's really nice to see uh, a closer look at the actual people who were going to the park. Um, this one in particular had a message written on the back about how amazing it was that this photo was taken um, under electric lights at nighttime. Can you believe it? Um, it does look very clear. Um, so all of these are from 1908, um, I think. Um, this one's both cute and sad. She's sitting there all alone, but uh, maybe this was their only chance to get a picture of their kid. Um, and the next one has a celebrity here. Um, does anyone recognize who's in this picture? Okay, we've got on the far right, Jack London. And in the, at the driver's seat, his, his wife, his second wife, Charmian. Um, Jack London was a, a pretty frequent visitor at Idora Park. Um, he would take his kids there. And one of his daughters, um, Becky, wrote a, sort of a memoir, a short memoir about her memories of going to the park with her dad. And apparently he was a, a war correspondent. So he would come home infrequently, but when he did, he would take her and her sister to the park and have a great day. And then at the end of the day, she was very sad to see him go again. Um, but uh, speaking of Jack London, <laughs> he also wrote about two of the other parks, uh, both Shell Mound Park, he wrote about in Martin Eden and he wrote about Badger's Park in uh, Valley of the Moon, uh, but he called it Weasel Park instead of Badger's Park. Um, so uh, that's our last uh, picture of people sitting in cars. And next up we have animals. So the Oakland Zoo was started in 1922. And before that, we had this very sad looking bear pit in Idora Park. Um, 
the bears look super cramped in there. And um, I think people were definitely throwing food into them and trying to poke them. Not, not ideal by today's standards, I, I would say. Um, but they did try to do a publicity stunt um, where they invited a couple to get married in a wild animal cage at the, at the park. Um, there wasn't any report that I found of this actually happening, so maybe no one took them up on it. Um, they said, uh, this was 1912, by the way. They said um, they got one response from a woman who was, was game, but she didn't have anyone to marry, so she just needed to find that part and then she would do it, but um, I didn't see a follow-up, so maybe it didn't work out for her. <laughs> Um, but I like that this says, uh, the company will guarantee perfect safety. How? I don't know. <laughs> um, there's also an ostrich farm. This was uh, put in in 1913. And it's a little more spacious, at least, based on this photo. Um, but ostrich feathers were a, a popular fashion accessory for, it, for a time there. So this would be a, a place to not only see ostriches, which is pretty exciting, but also maybe get a, a souvenir to add to your hat. Um, and there's also, at some point, there was a monkey house in later years. Uh, we don't have a picture of that, unfortunately. Um, and there are also a lot of um, live performances happening at the park. This is a little outdoor bandstand. Um, and this is the amphitheater, another view of the amphitheater. So this one is, the postcard says bandstand on it. This is obviously the amphitheater. Um, I'm not sure if this was like, um, it, this giant thing replaced that little wooden bandstand or if they were parallel, two separate bandstands, it's hard to say. Um, but uh, this was a, venue for touring musicians, uh, as well as things like uh, wrestling matches and other like open air spectacle kind of entertainments. This picture is Henry Olmeyer's band uh, in 1910. Um, there was a separate indoor theater as well. Here we have the theater building in the background and the park is decorated um, with some lovely paper lanterns for some sort of special occasion. Um, there's another view of the theater building. This was one of the first things that they built at the park. And initially it hosted a rotating bill of traveling vaudeville acts. Uh, the first act to play there was the Republic Minstrels. Um, they did two, two shows a day when the park first opened. Um, and here's a, a really typical vaudeville bill. This is from 1903 as well from the summer. They've got the tramp, who's probably a clown, um, a balancing act, Spanish dancer, contortionists, illustrated songs, and moving pictures in 1903, which were uh, very, very new and exciting. <laughs> um, and amateur night on Fridays. And for the 4th of July, of course, they had fireworks. Um, this is the theater or auditorium again, um, and this maybe looks like s some of the some of our homes during the pandemic, uh, totally decked out in plants. Um, and this is um, just to show you an idea of what was happening in those two venues. These would have been in both the amphitheater and the theater. So they've got four different bands uh, that each have a month long run. Um, and then they've got the Idora comic opera season um, and then followed by the grand opera season. This was all 1911. So after the 1906 earthquake, uh, Idora Park got a resident theater company. Um, the Tivoli Theater Company from San Francisco um, relocated to Idora Park, uh, named themselves the Idora Park Comic Opera Company. And this is one of the things that people really um, remembered and, and loved about Idora Park. Um, a lot of the reminiscences I've read from people are all about like seeing this group perform and their, their leader was named Ferris Hartman. Um, whoops, 
I went too fast. Um, so they um, mostly did comic operas and light operas as their name implies. Um, so if you think of like Gilbert and Sullivan or um, Victor Herbert, that's the kind of stuff they were doing mostly. This one is a postcard showing a, a comic scene from The Tenderfoot, which was a 1908 um, musical. And a member of the company who's probably most well-known to us is Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. He was a famous uh, comedian in silent movies. This is a, a screen cap from a movie that he made at Idora Park. Um, that's uh, his co-star Mabel Normand on the left. Uh, this was from 1915. It's a, a one real Keystone comedy. Um, you can watch it on YouTube. Um, I wouldn't totally recommend it. Um, it's not great, but um, it does show um, moving images of Idora Park. So they're riding the carousel, they're feeding the bears, um, and they go down the mountain slide, which we'll see a little bit later. So that's pretty cool that they filmed this at Idora Park. And apparently it was um, his idea, his suggestion. Uh, they were the company the Keystone Company was thinking like, we should do a movie at an amusement park. And since he had worked with the comic opera company at Adora Park in 1912, he thought Adora Park would be the perfect place. Let's do it. And um, this was really good publicity for Adora Park. Um, they had newspaper articles for weeks before this movie was filmed um, saying, come see it being filmed, see how they do it. Um, you might be get a chance to be an extra in the movie. Um, and then after it was filmed, they had more newspaper articles about like every everything that happened and how the person making pies um, was so sad to see her pies used to be thrown in people's faces. And so she, she made worse pies the next day for them to throw. Um, so yeah, it was a, a big uh, publicity for the park, even though they don't actually name the park in the movie. So you can watch it and have no idea where it's happening, but at the time uh, it was good advertisement. So 1906, a huge skating rink was put in. Um, it was advertised as the biggest skating rink in the world. Um, it was also the biggest building on the West Coast that had a roof uh, that was not supported by posts. So they have steel beams in the roof, which was um, somewhat new, I guess, at that time um, to have one that big, at least. Um, here it is again. So they had um, lots of windows to let in natural light, which you can see here. There was a raised bandstand in the middle with another band um, playing every night uh, for people to skate to uh, and seats all around for spectators to watch. Um, they had races, lot, lots and lots of skating races. Um, you can see their, their little trophy at the bottom there that they're competing for um, and their, their wonderful skating outfits. Um, so there's a rumor that Charlie Chaplin was a roller skating champion at Idora Park. I, don't, I couldn't find any confirmation that he was or that he was ever at Idora Park, but it's possible. Um, he was making movies with SNA Studio in Niles in um, 1915. And in 1916, he starred in a movie called The Rink, which shows off some pretty impressive roller skating skills. So maybe he was practicing at Idora Park, but I'm not sure. Um, then in 1916, they added an open air inland beach swimming pool. It had heated salt water. Um, they had slides, diving boards, trapezes, and a uh, sandy beach with palm trees. And they had obviously swimming costumes that you could rent. Um, and they offered free swimming lessons in the summers that were sponsored by the Oakland Tribune. Um, and when it was built, they, they advertised that they were planning to convert it into an ice rink in the wintertime but I didn't see any advertisements that showing like come come ice skating. So I don't think they ever did, but it's an interesting idea. It seems um, like it would be hard to convert a saltwater pool to a ice rink, but who knows? <laughs> um, 
but it was used at least once for something other than swimming when uh, this famous evangelist, uh, Amy Simple McPherson, uh, did a mass baptism. This was 1922. And depending on which of the two articles about this are correct, uh, she baptized either 100 or 1,000 uh, converts uh, in the Idora Park pool. Um, and who knows? <laughs> um, so last but not least about Idora Park were the rides. So I don't know if this qualifies as a ride, but um, this is the Fagiol Automobile Train. I'm not sure how to say the name of this company because I looked it up several times how to pronounce it and each place I looked had a different pronunciation. So I'm just guessing. But the Fagiol brothers were um, in the automobile business in Oakland and they made um, cars, buses, trucks, and automobile trains. Uh, this is from 1915. Uh, they also had one like this. I'm not sure if it was the exact same one or a different one, but at the Panama Pan Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. Um, so five cent fare, you could hop on, ride around, or you could ride the Idora Park Miniature Railway System, also five cents. Um, this is the Barrel of Fun. I'm not sure if this is maybe the Laughing Gallery or if this is um, like one of those rides that has like a spinning cylinder that you try to walk through. Um, I didn't see any description of what this was, but uh, it's an interesting shape at least to look at. Um, then here's in the foreground, the social whirl. Again, I think that's a spinning thing where the floor spins around, but uh, no, no description of it anywhere. So I'm not sure. Um, and oops, this, here's another view of the barrel. There's a archery concession on the left here, a roller coaster in the background. And I believe this is the carousel in the middle with the sort of uh, cone shape roof. Um, here's the tickler. This was new in 1908. And to me, this looks like they're just in half of a barrel with casters on the bottom and they're bonking into like very thin metal poles on their way down. But um, there was a, an article describing this when it was new uh, saying that the cars are made of steel and that quote, it was necessary to make this course unusually durable owing to the tremendous strain to which it is subjected. So they were at least trying to make it safe, but doesn't look, doesn't look too good. <laughs> um, these are the flying airships, sort of boats on chains that spin around in a circle. Um, and they also had a, a circle swing, which was sort of just a circular plank of wood that spun around, which is a thing you can still ride if you visit a Renaissance fair, I think. Um, and here's something I mentioned before, the mountain slide. This was literally a fake mountain that you slide down sitting on your, on your butt uh, on a burlap sack. And uh, in the center here, there's the entrance for the auto race course. Um, here it is again, you can sort of see the tracks. So it looks like a little bit like a mini roller coaster. Um, and I've got a couple, yeah, this, this one shows what the, course looked like. This is, um, did I already say this was new in 1908 as well. So a lot of these rides look a little bit tame by today's standards, um, a little bit. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to remember that they basically had no safety precautions like we would have today. Um, so accidents did happen. This one, the headline kind of gives you an idea how serious the injuries were. If the headline is amputation, not necessary. Um, so this kid was thrown from that ride we just saw, the auto race course, um, and both of his legs were broken. Horrible. Um, his family later sued the park for $10,000, and this was 1912, so it was quite a serious injury. Um, I didn't find a ton, I didn't search a lot for injury articles, but I didn't find a ton just 
when I was going through. Um, so maybe it's safer than it seems, but not in every case. Um, this one is Arrive, which you can tell is going to be a big deal because the entrance is basically a castle. Um, I think it's really interesting that they made a postcard that does not show what the ride is at all. You can sort of see the name of it. Um, this is the Thompson Scenic Railway, and here's a picture of what it actually was. Um, this was at the park's opening in 1903, and this is um, a a uh, early roller coaster sort of um, looks pretty tame. And uh, over the years, it uh, sort of went down in popularity because it wasn't as thrilling as some of the newer things. But um, here's a view from on board, which I think is a really great photograph. Um, so this um, company who built this roller coaster advertised another one around the same time that went up to 25 miles per hour. So for people who had never maybe ridden in a car before, that might've been just amazing. Um, but later they built other roller coasters. This is the race through the clouds, which is a little bit faster, a little bit steeper. Um, and it looks about the same, in my opinion. At first I thought this was the same roller coaster that they renamed, but it's actually a different one that's a, a little bit more, more thrilling. Um, another one was added in 1922, the Big Dipper. Um, we don't have a photo of it, but we do have this illustration, which makes it look pretty exciting. Um, and there's a couple other ones throughout the years. There was a, an, another early one called the Figure Eight, which was kind of gentle, like the, um, the Scenic Railway. And then the very last one was introduced in 1927, was the Thunderbolt. And that one was, they said, probably rebuilt from the Big Dipper, but to make it totally different and exciting, they just did a new, new configuration. Um, and so eventually, Idora Park closed. So this uh, announcement on the left here was uh, in the Tribune, December 10th, 1928. And the article underneath this quoted the management as saying, um, the property has become too valuable for amusement purposes. Um, so basically what they had planned all along uh, happened. They made the land valuable by getting people to go there and having streetcars to go there. Um, and in 1928, the depression was raging. Uh, so 10 cent admission was probably getting to be a little, little much for people. And um, a lot of the contracts for the concessions were expiring um, at that time too. So the time was right for the company to turn this into houses. Um, initially, they, they said their plan was to make this area into um, office space and apartment buildings but they ended up doing uh, single family homes, which are um, still there today. And uh, this was, um, it, it claims to be the first um, area in the West to have underground utilities. Uh, there's, there's some dispute to that claim, but it's definitely the first in Oakland. Um, and so this is a map from 1929 showing the uh, subdivision uh, we have a map also from 1912 showing a suggestion for subdivision. So this was a longstanding plan, although it may maybe came as a surprise to people who um, loved Idora Park and uh, were, were visitors there. So um, after Idora Park, another option was Neptune Beach, um, which was in Alameda. Uh, this was open from 1917 to 1939, and it was in the area where Crab Cove is today. Uh, it had a swimming pool with fountains. It had rides like Ferris wheel, roller coasters, and you can see the circular swing ride thing in the foreground here. Um, and there were really nice views of the bay from, from all the rides. Um, Here's almost exactly the same view, but in a color postcard. Um, 
Another thing that Neptune Beach had that Idora Park did not was parking. Um, so since Idora was built as a trolley park, they didn't really they didn't really consider having a parking lot. But by the late 19 teens, that became really important for people to be able to take their car there. Um, so there were also lots of special events that happened at Neptune Beach. Um, I think the the pool seems like it was one of the main draws, um, but they hosted things like the 14 mile around the island swimming race that happened every year. They had prize fights, beauty contests, um, and it was also surrounded by sort of vacation cottages, um, some of which are still there today. So it could be like a fun uh, weekend getaway for people. And um, uh, Neptune Beach, uh, sort of fell to the depression. So uh, throughout the 1930s, crowds were getting smaller and smaller and eventually they went bankrupt in 1939. So they held on for a good long while, but um, when they closed their rides and props were auctioned off and their, their carousel actually went to Playland at the beach. So that was the end of an era for amusement parks in the East Bay. Neptune Beach was the last the last one that was really here and today there's not not really an equivalent of anything like this nearby um so yeah that's also the end of my uh presentation so i'll stop sharing my screen here and if anyone has um questions uh you can ask questions um or if you have uh memory from visiting any of these parks you can you can share um someone in the beginning earlier on in your presentation asked do we know when you were talking about shell mound park asked do we know the tribe and why are we saying indian um yes we do know it was ohlone people so um sorry i apologize uh if i said indian just um, um, an error. Um, so yeah, the, the whole Bay Area, the whole area around the Bay Area had lots and lots of shell mounds. Um, so the one where Shell Mound Park was, was one of the, one of the biggest and one of the ones that was, um, that was around for the longest time. So um, yeah. Uh, Suzanne, I think, has a question. Can you un unmute yourself, Suzanne? Where Suzanne. did they get the name Idora? You know, I, um, is it a child's name and they named it after somebody's child? Yeah, supposedly it's named after the... After back to using any of these plants. I went swimming in Flyshacker outdoor pool in San Francisco. That was up for a long, long time. That was a, a lovely place to spend. Anyone else? I, I can't see all of you, so, oh, Tammy. Hi, hi, Emily. In your research, did you find anything around like the demographics of the people who use the parks? It looked like it was mainly at least middle class folk. You know, people have some level of means. And like, were there any parks that tended to be places where, where you know, black or Latino people congregated more than others? Did you find anything around that? Yeah, I'm not sure so much because a lot of the research that I I'm able to do is based on looking at the Oakland Tribune, which was a, a very conservative um, newspaper, um, and looking at postcards and other advertisements, which mostly feature, they do feature um, white people and people who look like they're well-dressed. But I don't know if that reflects the reality of what the park was like, um, or if that's um, just the image they were trying to present. Um, so 
I'm, I'm not totally sure. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, Martha. But you did have that picture of the uh, uh, Afro-American uh, group that gathered at Idora. Yeah, those were, that was at Shell Mountain Park. Shell Mountain. So, um, yeah, there, there was at least one um, African-American group there, but I don't know um, on, a, like on an average day what it was like. Um, I think Dorothy has her hand raised. Hi, Emily. Thanks for this presentation. Uh, I just wanted to say about uh, the question of, uh, to address the question about the demographics. Yes. Uh, Shell Mound Park was, uh, as far as the evidence that we have available in the History Center, it was uh, frequented mostly by uh, uh, white uh, people, but it was open to other people as well. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of physical, physical evidence or photographic evidence of that. But, um, you know, stories about the park include stories from other groups of people who uh, frequented the park. And also uh, they had, unfortunately, I think, um, uh, people who were um, part of the, um, amusements, let's say, you know, like dunking and stuff like that, the dunk tank, mm -hmm. um, they were um, used for that as well. Yeah, and I, I did see there were, um, like, when we were talking about the vaudeville shows, there were certainly like minstrel shows and um, what people described as like coon singers, which is like, there were people there who were not white, but was it um, in the way that, like, were they there as a participant or were they being exploited in some way? Um, was, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, Any, anyone else have questions or thoughts to share? Aren't they? Suzanne? I thought I heard someone start talking, but no. Does anyone in our audience remember Frontier Village, which was more in the South Bay, That's like the Fremont, San Jose, Milpitas area? By the way, Dorothy is uh, the head librarian in the Oakland History Center, so she's she's an expert on all this stuff too. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> uh, does anybody remember? Well, Frontier Village, I remember being, um, you know, some parks, you know, like Disneyland are kind of connected to a core group of uh, characters, you know, like the Disney characters, Mickey Mouse and all of that. Frontier Village was connected to the Hanna-Barbera cartoon characters. Um, and it was very Western oriented. My memory says it was in Fremont, but it may have been in San Jose, uh, which is out of our topic area, but one of my fond memories. And there was another, somebody mentioned something about Idora Park and, and, and asking about its name. There is an Idora Park um, in Ohio, I think Canfield, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that predates our Idora Park. I'll have to find that out. I think it did when, when I was looking it up because some people were suggesting that I, our Oakland's Idora Park was named for that one. Um, but Oh yeah, that was the conflict in information. Yeah. 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 So some things it's just, it's really hard to figure out what's what when you're basing it on advertisements and um, like sort of press release kind of material it's hard to tell if you're getting like a, a really true picture of what what was happening and what things were like. Um, but really super interesting to look through this stuff. So um, as I said, all of the, almost all the images in the, the presentation were from our collection in the Oakland History Center. And uh, we have even more that I, I didn't have space to share all of, uh, or this would have gone on forever. Um, 
So if you are interested in finding out more, um, once, once the library reopens, um, you're welcome to come in and browse and research all sorts of things besides just amusement parks. Um, and if you do have questions that you think of later, you can send them to us um, uh, by email is the best way, eanswers at oaklandlibrary.org. Um, and yeah, if uh, someone there has a question, I think, John? I think you're muted still, John. Unmute yourself, John. Can you hear me? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Can you hear me? This is Barry. Oh, Barry, go ahead. Um, one of the things that I noticed that you said that the one park, the Neptune Park, stopped in 1939. That's when the Golden Gate, that's when the Bay Bridge opened. Is that mm -hmm. when people started going to San Francisco? Is that when Playland got going and at the same well, time? Yeah, Playland started much earlier, but survived much longer. So, so but it, it kind of stole the, some of the customers that might yeah. have gone to Neptune Beach. Yeah, so there's all of these parks, there's sort of a narrative like, well, Idora Park caused the shutdown of Shell Mountain Park because Idora Park was more popular and then Neptune Beach became more popular and that caused Idora Park to close. But the dates overlap so much that I don't, that narrative doesn't really totally ring true because their, their dates of operation were so overlapping. But I do think like the rise in automobiles um, or cars, as we call them in, in modern language, um, did lead to the decline of these places. Uh, you, did, you also had with the with the bridge opening. You also had the, with the fair, the, the big big world fair in San Francisco, which sucked up a lot of people for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. That must have been hard on some of the uh, local local carnival type things. Yeah. Uh, the, the question I had was about children's fairyland. I'm not from around around here. Why didn't you include that in the presentation or? Um, children's fairyland is, um, in my mind, it's not exactly the same thing because it is only for children. Um, if adults go there, they have to have a child, child with them. And it's been that way since since it opened. So it's really more of a children's park, whereas all the these other parks were um, really all ages. And um, it's, I think kind of, um, it, it's, Fairyland is sort of a pretty unique place, but I think it is in a sort of a different category from the other amusement parks. I don't know if, um, if other people disagree or agree with that statement, but that's why, that was my reasoning behind not including it. Emily, were there other um, quirky things that you didn't get to add that you, that you would like to share? about any of the parks or things that you wonder about? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> a couple of things, I think I sort of briefly mentioned there were high diving horses at Idora Park, but they, I didn't mention that there were advertising um, for, they were challenging amateur riders to come ride these diving horses off of a 40 foot platform into a pool. Um, and they said no professional uh, equestrians or acrobats are allowed, only amateurs. Um, and I think that was maybe 1912, but it was just really highlights like how different things are from today's world where no one would, no one would do that. <laughs> um, you would be sued so quickly. Um, but that was, that was a really amazing one. And then I saw there was an advertisement for Eugene V. Debs speaking at Idora Park one of one of the few like uh, political speech kind of events that I saw there, but that was um, certainly a famous person who was there. I think another. I think another thing that really replaced the uh, all the carnivals is at Disneyland. Disneyland and the big commercial uh, operations took over, 
and knowing the little carnivals couldn't compete and travel became so much easier to get to Disneyland. So a lot of the things that were at the Playlands at the beach are now a couple of Disneyland on the east and Disneyland on the west. Yeah, and people sort of talk about amusement parks and theme parks as two separate things. And maybe I would put Fairyland more in the theme, in the theme park um, category because everything there is really about fairy tales and like Disneyland, everything is about uh, Disney characters uh, and Disney properties. Um, whereas amusement parks were sort of more of a free-for-all kind of feel where uh, if you wanted, if you had some archery equipment and you wanted to rent an archery concession for the year, you could do that. Um, and I think that's sort of um, a, an interesting contrast. It's sort of the, the amusement parks are more of a um, carnival sideshow kind of, kind of uh, vibe uh, instead of a, a really tightly controlled um, character driven experience like a theme park is. And Emily, the, um, I, would I would add that uh, some of the small amusement parks, particularly in the East Bay, uh, went under for financial reasons, but also just the pressure uh, for land. You know, some of these uh, places, you know, Idora Park neighborhood or de uh, development is a pretty sizable and they were trying to promote the land, as you mentioned. Um, and so with the, especially after 1906, after the quake, tens of thousands of people moved to the East Bay. And so there was this real pressure for, for land, uh, the availability of land. And so there, you know, and also people like Borak Smith, uh, who was one of the developers of the park, was primarily a real estate agent, as you said, you know. Um, so I think that really caused the demise of some of them. Yeah, definitely Shell Mound and Idora, I think, are, are in that category. Uh, Shell Mound Park became industrial use. Um, Idora Park became housing. Neptune Beach, I think, is interesting that it, it didn't become. Um, it's still, today, is, it's like a beach, but I don't know what, uh, maybe just, they just went bankrupt, it seems like. Um, yeah, but I think also I've seen people mention like, well, television was becoming popular and, but I think it's a little early for that to have really caused the, the decline, uh, but maybe movies were becoming more popular than, than live theater and vaudeville for sure. Um, and um, the, the comic opera wasn't quite as popular in, in 1925 as it had been in 1918. Um, so yeah, I think just changing tastes too. And once you've been there a million times, maybe you don't want, you want to go somewhere else instead, go somewhere new. So yeah, I think um, unless anyone else has questions, maybe we, we can end here and thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Um, yeah, and have a really good rest of your day. This is great, Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Emmy. Thank you, Emily. It was terrific. You're welcome.